back here uh, with what is promising to be another exceptional panel. In fact, uh, we have four distinguished people once again who will be talking about, well, where we go from here um, and continuing to examine the kind of problems that I think uh, were thrashed out in the first panel. Uh, how serious, how uh, formidable is this problem of class division and, what do we, and now more specifically, what kind of solutions, what do we do about it? I think we certainly have a better feel for it, and I hope it's been extremely illuminating. It certainly has, uh, speaking personally, for me. And I'm also, once again, impressed with the distinguished panel that we had this morning and the distinguished panel that you'll have this afternoon. And once again, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and to be involved in the process. Um, actually, we're going to be, before I introduce all the panelists, uh, we're going to be um, kind of have a leadoff hitter here. I just got over uh, watching uh, my beloved Giants uh, win uh, three out of five, unprecedented, by the way, um, to lose the first two and then win the next three. And as those of you who are baseball lovers know, a lot has to do with the leadoff hitter. But in this case, we've got also a whole batting order going right up to the cleanup with Ralph Nader. Um, we're going to be, however, introducing first Neil Ferguson. And Neil Ferguson is certainly someone who has made, um, to put it mildly, a reputation for himself. Uh, I would call it a transatlantic reputation because he's one of our leading intellectuals both here and what I guess we describe as across the pond uh, over on the other side of the Atlantic. He's Lawrence A. Tisch, professor of history at Harvard and William Ziegler, professor of business administration at Harvard Business School. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford and a senior research fellow at uh, Jesus College in Oxford. And you imagine wearing all those hats almost toppled over by them. Uh, he's published 12 books to date. Uh, his most recent book is Civilization, The West and the Rest, which was made into a PBS Channel 4 documentary series. He's a regular contributor to television and radio, again, on both sides of the Atlantic, and is a weekly columnist for Newsweek, as well as contributing editor of Bloomberg TV. A man of extraordinary energy, and in that, case, in that sense, uh, it's good that we have him leading off here as well, because it's not only his energy, but the fact that he has a slideshow. Uh, Time Magazine named him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And he also is the author of a uh, PBS series, the, a the, the, the Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World, uh, and a PBS series winning the International Emmy Award for Best Documentary titled High Financier, The Lives and Times of Sigmund Warburg, which appeared in 2010. Please give a warm Siebel Scholar welcome for our first speaker, Neil Ferguson. Well, th thank you very much indeed. What I'm going to do is slightly unorthodox, uh, but I felt that it would help if after lunch we had an opportunity to refocus our minds a little bit. And also, I, I, it gives me a chance to sum up some of the issues that we've heard so far. I made the mistake this morning at our, our preparatory meeting of saying, all these computer scientists and MBA types are, are data-driven. They're going to feel a little frustrated if we just talk casually in the language of what we now must call comic social science. So, <laughs> phrase I'm not sure I'm entirely comfortable with. But So what I thought I would do to begin this, uh, this session would be just to walk through what I think are at least some of the, the key data that we need to bear in mind as we discuss this problem of class warfare uh, and try to work out uh, remedies. I thought I would begin where we began with uh, Charles Murray's brilliant book. Uh, in some ways, th this is what Coming Apart is explaining. It's explaining a really quite distinctive trend in family income distribution uh, that seems to begin around about the 1980s and reach a peak uh, on the eve of the financial crisis. There are lots of different ways of looking at these numbers. This is to look at median family income for different centiles. Uh, or you can do what uh, we've already heard uh, Robert Reich do and, and relate uh, co compensation of executives uh, to compensation of workers. And these are just ratios showing the extraordinary run-up in the ratio of executive pay to worker pay uh, from around about the 
mid-1970s, as you can see from this chart. So bosses got richer than workers, which is what Marx said would happen. And insofar as we should bear Marx in mind, this looks at least at first sight as evidence uh, for the, the, the Marxist case. Another way of looking at this is to take Emmanuel Sizer's data, which I, I've done here, and look at a ratio of the average income of the 1% to the average income of everybody else. This is, I guess, the signature chart of the Occupy movement. When you do that and you go all the way back to 1913, you can see that measured this way, inequality uh, in the United States is back where it was on the eve of the Great Depression. And it's interesting that that peak was a peak. It had run up in the 20s from what had previously been uh, less abnormal uh, levels. I think there's at least some evidence, though David Brooks may disagree, uh, that social mobility has declined uh, in the United States since the 1970s. This is looking at the chance of adult men born into the bottom 25% moving to the top 25%. Of course, there are a great many different ways of measuring social mobility, and this is only one. Uh, but, and I've given the wrong source because that's not uh, from Emmanuel Sizes, that's actually from a Business Week piece published in 2004. There are lots of, of different ways of measuring social mobility, but most of those that I know suggest that it has declined. And I think we have to draw a distinction here between inequality as a kind of static snapshot uh, measure and the more dynamic notion of social mobility. Going back to something that was said earlier, it might be that Americans used to console themselves with greater inequality than Europeans in return for greater social mobility. That claim I don't think can plausibly be made anymore, a point that Condi Rice made very eloquently last night. So these are the different phenomena or different measures of the phenomenon of inequality that we are concerned with here. What caused these changes? Was it fiscal policy? I expected to hear much more about that, particularly in this uh, election year. A conventional analysis on the left is that the Bush tax cuts and indeed tax changes since Ronald Reagan have a large share of responsibility for increased inequality. Or is it about education? This is evidence here that having, uh, having education really has a big impact uh, on what happens to you. So this is chances of getting ahead for children with and without a college degree from families of varying income. And so if you are born into the bottom uh, it really makes a huge difference to your life chances whether or not uh, you have a college degree. So suspect number two, the kind of educational problem that Secretary Rice talked about last night, which is making it harder for people in poor zip codes to get the kind of secondary education that would get them uh, to college and get them a degree. At the core of, of Charles Murray's brilliant book is an argument, I think, about the decline of well, I'll call it civil society, though it's not quite the term that he uses, a decline of a network of institutions that used to make working-class America a more socially stable place than it is now. The family was much discussed, marriage was much discussed in that panel, but it's not just marriage, because Charles, as you know if you've read the book, Charles talks about other things that have also markedly declined. Uh, here are some data from my uh, next book, The Great Degeneration, looking at lack of participation uh, in almost any conceivable form of voluntary association uh, from the United States data from six years ago. Interestingly here, you start to see almost no difference between the United States and the United Kingdom, where previously people saw there has been quite a difference. Or do we blame globalization and technology? This paper here shows the decline of jobs in tradable sectors in the United States uh, since the late 1980s. I find it quite hard to tease out the impact of globalization uh, and the impact of technological change. That they're so intertwined because in many ways it's the technology that's made globalization uh, so dramatic 
and particularly has made it possible to globalize sectors that previously were not tradable. And this is where services start to be globalized in a way that previously only manufacturing was. So we have quite a wide range of possible explanations. And clearly, we have to agree this afternoon on the ranking of these culprits, because presumably they can all be a bit to blame in theory, before we can come to any serious discussion of what we do. What I want to do very briefly before we go to the general discussion is make the point emphatically that this is not just an American story. Although we are here to talk about class warfare in America, or let's just say inequality to be uh, somewhat less uh, focused on the pol political aspect, it is not an exclusively American phenomenon. We can see the same ten trends in income distribution in every English-speaking country. The U.S. is an extreme uh, case, but it's not part of a uniquely U.S. trend. You can even see this trend in Scandinavia, which all Americans assume is an egalitarian paradise. Actually, there have been significant changes in income distribution in Scandinavia, uh, too. And it's happening. Uh, sorry to lose the top of the title. It's also happening in some major emerging markets, including, of course, the one that many people in this room know well, China. So I think we can't have a discussion uh, of class and inequality that is exclusively American. We have to recognize that there is a global trend at work here, though it is not a universal trend. There are countries where this has not happened, and Germany is one, where there really has not been a significant uh, change in income distribution. And this is important, I think, for us to try to understand in terms of uh, causation. You can't just blame everything on Republican tax cuts. Throughout the world, as this rather messy chart from the OECD shows, top marginal personal income tax rates have come down. And guess what? The US is actually somewhere in the middle of this plate of spaghetti in terms of where the top marginal personal income tax rate is right now. It is not by any means the extreme case when it comes to reductions in this particular measure uh, of taxation. I want to suggest to you that the real puzzle is the absence of class conflict. You can look at this chart in to, uh, today's uh, Economist, which has a special supplement on inequality, which I speed read this morning. I also put together these slides at high speed, which is why they're a bit of a mess. <laughs> but the one puzzle that strikes me when I look at this evidence that the Gini coefficient has gone up in many places, though not all, and this evidence of where the world has become more unequal, the orange places of where it's got more unequal and the greener places where it's got less unequal, the puzzle is where the class conflict is. There's no question that there has been a significant shift in income distribution in many countries and a decline in social mobility in some countries. But what we're not seeing is the kind of political expression of that that Marx would lead us to expect. And I think that's something that we should get to in the discussion. It's something that, in fact, came up in the conference call that we had ahead of, of this conference. Some people feel indignant about this, and they were there and well represented in the Occupy movement. It is hard, to, I think, to claim that it is at the heart of this presidential election debate because in the debate, uh, and this was also true in the vice presidential debate, the candidates talk as if everybody belongs to the middle class. And this is, of course, a great puzzle for any foreigner in trying to understand the United States. How can there possibly be class war if everybody belongs to the middle class? I want to offer a, a suggestion as to why there is not much class conflict in the world today. There's some, but much less than you would expect after 20 plus years of widening inequality. The global rich are certainly uh, global as well as rich. And although the United States, as you can see from these data, provides a lot of the global rich, uh, it's not even uh, half of all the millionaires. The global rich coexist with a far, far larger global middle class. The real story of the last 20 or 30 years is not really inequality, which it seems to me is a story for the inside pages. The front page news is the rise of a vast bourgeoisie 
in the non-Western world, and in particular in China. As you can see, if you cut the global population into deciles, China accounts for a huge proportion of the middle class now, which simply wasn't the case back in the 1970s when China was still a dirt poor country. And I want to conclude by suggesting to you that class warfare in America is the wrong thing to worry about. That's not going to happen. One reason it's not going to happen is that inequality in this country is not radically different, at least by some measures, uh, from that which you encounter in Germany. Why? Because if you look at inequality of opportunity as a share of total inequality, the numbers for Germany and the United States are identical. So one can't, in fact, make the claim, as was made in the first panel, that there's a profound difference between how Germany works and how the US works. This doesn't seem to be true in the data. The real issue is not class, uh, class war in America. The real issue is the rising middle class in China. And the one thing that I know as a historian is that when you have a rising middle class, especially one as vast as this, you have rising expectations. And the conflict that arises from those rising expectations is not the kind of thing that Marx anticipated. It's a liberal bourgeois revolution that ultimately emerges. And with that, I will thank you very much indeed and invite my fellow panelist or our moderator to join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And now we're going to hear from the other panelists who you see here uh, assembled and taking their chairs. Uh, Charles Murray literally needs no introduction. We introduced Charles earlier, and all you, you got to hear his biography. Let me tell you the other two who are with us here. Uh, between Charles and Neil is Lewis Lapham. And Lewis Lapham is former managing editor of Harper's Magazine and founding editor of Lapham's Quarterly, which I believe you all got the most recent issue of in your room on politics. Uh, Lewis was actually a newspaper reporter for the San Francisco Examiner. He's a son come home in many respects. These are his roots here in San Francisco. In fact, um, uh, he comes from a kind of um, at least politically patrician family, including a member of his family who was mayor of San Francisco at one point. The New York Herald Tribune also was a place where he was once um, identified as a contract writer also for the Saturday Evening Post, for Life Magazine. He has uh, a, a really ex exceptional history in the world of journalism, inducted, in fact, into the American Society of Magazine Editors Hall of Fame back in 2007, and continues to write a bi-monthly notebook column for Harper's. Documentary film, The American Ruling Class, Lewis Lapham's documentary film, premiered at the 2005 Tribeca Film Festival in New York City. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Century Club, the Advisory Council to the New York School University, New School University, and he's lectured at many of the leading universities. Please welcome Lewis Lapham. We also have on this distinguished panel this afternoon, Ralph Nader, <coughs> consumer advocate, author of the famous book, Unsafe at Any Speed. He was honored by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential <coughs> Americans of the 20th century. Recently is one of the 100 most influential figures in American history. That was by Atlantic. Uh, not only consumer advocate, but presidential candidate with the Green Party and as an independent, uh, and has a new book out called The 17 Traditions. Uh, he's also, uh, excuse me, The 17 Tr Traditions was an earlier book. It was a memoir about his life growing up with all the civic value and citizenship value that he was schooled in in Connecticut, his home state. But his publishers thought it was advised to bring back the number 17. So the recent book is called The 17 Solutions, and the subtitle is Bold Ideas for Our American Future. Welcome, Ralph Nader. So if we may, Lewis Lapham, we'll go next to you. And give us your thoughts. Well, I'm glad to know the revolution is going to take place in China. <laughs> <laughs> I came prepared to talk about class warfare. As far as I can see, there is class warfare. It's, 
and it's a fairly traditional one. It's been going on for many thousands of years since the war of the rich against the poor. Uh, it seems to me that if you look back over the last, say, 30-odd years in, in the United States, if you see that legislation that's been coming out of the Congress, whether it's Republican or Democrat, the rulings that are handed down by the Supreme Court, the bias is more freedom for property, less freedom for the individual. And if you run that all different kinds through all different environmental uh, campaign finance, uh, Ralph will take you through the whole list. Uh, and the Citizens United is is of course a part of that. And with it, the um, failure of American public public education. And with it, the, uh, the loss of the idea of citizenship. Charles Murray talks about the American project. The American project is, in my view, the notion that um, you hold one's fellow citizens in thoughtful regard, not because they are beautiful or rich or famous, but because they are, one, you, they are one's fellow citizens. This is the Tom Paine idea, the idea that the strength of government and the happiness of the government follows from the freedom of the common people to mutually support one another. And the means of that mutual support, that is to say, the infrastructure that, uh, on, that on which we base our common enterprise, roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, and so forth, has been systematically uh, let fall into disrepair or has been um, um, privatized and taken over for a public interest. The, the idea that, for example, we have to have a health care system which must uh, uh, is intended to make a profit rather than to profit provide a public good is already uh, away from the notion, of the Tom Paine notion of democracy, where the uh, pay, pay, a, a democratic society puts a premium on equality, and a capitalist economy does not. I mean, that's just, they have different they're going in different directions. The founders tried to solve that problem with the Constitution. They try to set up uh, the means by which the citizens uh, of the country can express their liberties. I mean, it, it's instruments set up for the liberties of the people, not for the ambitions of the state. And that notion of a republic doesn't really last very long, but w before the, where very many, it probably doesn't survive the War of 1812, and by the end of the 19th century, we have a commercial oligarchy, which is what we have now. And the um, oligarchy accepts uh, diversions, a uh, difference between the, um, the rich and the poor. Voltaire, the comfort of the rich depends upon an abundance of the poor. <laughs> so I think that the, uh, the uh, failures of our public school system is, is deliberate on the, on the part of a uh, owning, ruling, and possessing class that is afraid of freedom, is afraid uh, of a truly educated and independent public. And so it's reasons that the test textbooks are no good. It, it's the, uh, anyway, they, uh, we can get into that later, but I've, that, that's more or less where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm sure it's going on in, in other parts of the world. It's been going on in other parts of the world for as uh, long as man has been uh, organized into states and nations and societies going on in ancient Athens, what was going on in Rome. Uh, the 
American exception, which is what Charles Murray talks about in his book, The American Project, which is the idea that we would all help one another and that the good was to be found in our society and our community. Americans differ from other people in the world, and at least in my opinion. That an Amer my observation is that an American on the first meeting uh, a stranger thinks that he has met a potential ally and friend. There's an instinctive, emotional, uh, we're in the same boat feeling. I mean, that, that is the guts to me of the American project. And the, that is what I think we have lost. And that, I think, is what we've lost over the last 30 odd years. And whether we can get it back or not, I don't know. Thank you, Louis Lapham. Uh, Charles Murray, you kind of outlined a lot of your position on class warfare this morning. Do you want to move on to uh, where we go from here? Or where oh, we yeah, that, exactly. Uh, that's my understanding of the purpose of this afternoon's session. Uh, when it comes to the new lower class, um, I am a libertarian, and, and libertarians don't do solutions. Uh, <laughs> You know, in, <laughs> involving government programs. When it comes to the new upper class, I, I do have some things to say. And, that, and actually, that's who the book is addressed to. Uh, and, and I'm now talking to people who are either already in the new upper class or are wannabes. And most of you will be successful. And let me suggest the things that you can do, which is the closest I can come to a solution, but that if millions of members of the new upper class all did them, it would change the country. Uh, one is to contemplate the notions of unseemliness that we talked this morning and resurrect those in your own life. Uh, the notion of unseemliness that you do things because you are being in obedient to the unenforceable. That there are standards of behavior uh, that you simply not only will not engage in yourself, but you will look down, openly look down, upon people who, who engage in unseemly behavior of the kinds we talked about this morning. But the more important issue has to do with, with how you live your lives, mostly based on where you choose to live. Um, as, as those of you who have read my work know, I have for a long time made the argument that there are really only four domains within which human beings achieve deep, lasting satisfactions in life. And those are vocation, family, vo uh, vocation, family community, and faith. And you don't have to tap into all four of them. Uh, but, uh, but, but to be a happy person in the Aristotelian sense, you have to tap into a couple of them. Well, you are all probably going to have vocations that you love. That's great. And, and most of you, I have a feeling, are going to do just fine in families. Uh, faith, I will not talk about. I'll leave that up to you. But, but community is another dimension to life that if you move to Atherton or Portola Valley, or to Scarsdale, or the Upper East Side of New York, or the uh, North Shore of Chicago, you will be deliberately cutting yourself off from a great deal of texture in life. That is not to say that I think that you should move to inner city Chicago, or to slums, or you know, to uh, raggedy little uh, 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 rural villages. Oh, I did that. Uh, but, but rather that you sh there are lots of choices you can make where you will have a nice house, as nice as you, you want, uh, 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 you know, interesting places uh, to go, but where you will be in a community that is much more diverse than you find in these bubbles, in these, in these very exclusive, homogeneous enclaves that we have now. What is the advantage in that? Well, they can be urban neighborhoods, by the way, as well as small towns, but what happens when you are in that kind of community is that there are things that need to be done to minister to human needs of the people around you. Human needs can mean that, that the neighbor across the street needs somebody to shovel or walk uh, because she's arthritic and, and needs some help. It can mean somebody who, who, who needs financial help. It can mean, for those of you who've ever lived in those kinds of communities, it can mean a thousand different kinds of things. But what you are engaged in at that point is, to me, the solution to a country which is inherently going to be unequal in all kinds of ways involving money, 
Uh, and that is you are engaged in the process of building valued places that can be filled by people of a huge variety of abilities and incomes and the rest of it. By valued places, I do not mean that you pat people on the head and say you should feel proud of what you're doing and so forth. I mean you really do value them for the role that they play in your life uh, and, and the role they play in the community's life. And they understand that they are valued. They fill a niche. That kind of thing does not happen wholesale. It does not happen with government programs. Uh, on the contrary, I'm on the record as thinking that the government is culpable in many ways of destroying all of that. But never mind that for the time being. You have it within your power to live a terrific life and a reasonably glossy life, but you also have it within your power to make choices that will lead to a more textured life. And the reason to do so is in your self-interest. It will be a more enriching life. Thank you, Charles Murray. Ralph Nader. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, how many people here are working minimum wage jobs? Seven and a quarter, eight dollars an hour. How many do not have health insurance? And how many come from families making under uh, 35000 a year? There you are. You heard the phrase, it's the economy, stupid, uh, as the phrase of uh, Jim Carville in the Clinton administration. Uh, my phrase is, it's the big corporations, smarty, that <clears throat> the vice president of Ford and the head of uh, the American Bar Association, a very conservative man, in 1959 wrote an article in a compendium that said that the modern corporation is the dominant institution in our culture, in our society. It is a hierarchical institution. It's authoritarian. It doesn't brook internal dissent. It doesn't have any constitutional rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights stop at the door of the corporation. They can invade your privacy and they can censor you. It's a organization that has so much power that it controls its own owners the investors, who are powerless and are told if they don't like the way their hired hands, the bosses, operate, uh, they can sell the stock, whether it's mutual funds, pension funds, individual investors. It's a control, power, concentrating institution. We're not talking about small business here, the global corporation. And if you look at the history, and I've had to interact with a wide variety of corporate lobbyists, corporate executives, and other people in Washington and elsewhere. If you look at the history, a good way to look at the history of any country uh, that purports to be democratic is to look at the collision between commercial values and civic values and to ask in area after area, where is the supremacy? Civic values, commercial values. In our country, the great breakthroughs in social justice, the abolition of slavery opposed by the business cotton plantations. The women's right to vote, not only opposed by some misogynic men, is opposed by the fledging industries because women were in the forefront of trying to abolish child labor and advance consumer protection. The farmer labor movements, they were opposed by the railroads and the banks in the case of the farmers in the late 19th century. And the uh, the workers, of course, uh, trying to make themselves collectively uh, important and unions were opposed by uh, their industrial employers. And it goes all the way down to now. Who is saying no with power to the major advances in our country, which when the people finally prevail because they have political movements or stronger labor movements or consumer movements or other things that countervail this commercial juggernaut, it's the corporations that constantly are saying no. They said no to auto safety. They said no to the Air and Water Pollution Act. They said no to Social Security. They said no to Medicare. They said no to progressive income tax. They said no to decent labor union laws as, as they have in, in Europe. In other words, you have to watch who is saying no to social justice movements, which when they finally lose and adjust to it, corporations are very adjustable when they're faced 
with resilient power by the people in various roles. They're very adjustable. You begin asking yourself, I guess that's the reason why every major religion, without exception, warned its adherents not to give too much power to the merchant class. Because the merchant class, and we can call it corporatism today, is driven by a very narrow yardstick, sales, profits, bonuses. And if there are not countervailing forces to inject civic values of health, safety, respect for posterity, values of layoff trying to buy politicians or buy elected judges, if we don't have those injected values, the corporations know few boundaries to their commercial avarice. For example, the cotton plantations had slaves. Today we have U.S. multinationals who contract with Indonesians and Vietnamese and, and Bangladeshis who uh, these companies uh, have uh, people close to slaves. No limit. When Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex in his farewell address in 1961 January, it's on the internet, he knew what he was talking about. He saw this devouring Moloch for which no weapon systems were ever confronted with the word enough. You never have Lockheed Martin say, oh, we built enough bombers. You never have General Dynamics say, we built enough <coughs> nuclear subs or enough aircraft carriers. And that's why the civic culture is critical. It is critical in strengthening labor unions establishing community economies like democratic credit unions, farmer to market, uh, to consumer marketplace, uh, indigenous uh, sustainable energy, the kind of, uh, of, of uh, community health clinics that aren't tied into the giant health uh, drug company industrial complex that emphasizes prevention, and all the other things that are going on in our country. But they need to be quantitatively more significant. So more and more consumer dollars are taken from the Bank of America, from ExxonMobil, into these healthier, more self-determining, more participating, smaller scale, with modern technology, community economies. Now, the important thing about what you're going into is how free are you going to be in your company or in your consulting firm if we allow this top-down authoritarian process that has huge energy can't deny their energy until they start declining, like our steel industry or auto industry. How, how far can you fulfill your human possibilities if your only alternative is to quit or become a whistleblower, and you know what that involves year after year? Now, when it comes to the family and the connection, since Charles is here, just look at the, look at the connections here. Corporations have never been more pervasive in people's lives. That's what modern corporations do. They strategically try to plan the food that we eat, the, the insurance that we get or don't get. They strategically try to plan the election system. They strategically try to plan every government department and agency. Uh, they put their own executives in high government positions. Uh, sometimes they, they push for regulation to regulate us. Uh, they plan the degree or lack of privacy that we're exposed to with a credit economy and all the electronic dossiers. They're planning our genetic future, Monsanto. Imagine owning uh, human gene sequences, which was considered abhorrent by the Council on Responsible Genetics, started by Harvard and an MIT scientist. Well, forgive me. Let me jump in a, for a, a few second. years ago. I, I just want, are you talking when you talk about toppling uh, hegemonic corporate power? Are you talking about a kind of revolution? I mean, do we get back to Marx, or are you just talking about sending out the kind of naders, raiders who are going to influence Congress in a way that's significant? There are two approaches. One is to strengthen the countervailing forces of yesteryear. That means access to the courts, to sue the corporations, stronger labor laws, stronger regulation. Uh, the nanotechnology and biotech industries have no ethical or legal framework to speak of. This is pretty unprecedented for tumultuous technologies. It means strengthening the rights of whistleblowers, people who want to take their conscience to work uh, and do the right thing. Uh, it, these are the, old, the older ones, as well as clean, cleaner elections with more choice of candidates on the ballot, not just uh, Republican and Democrat dialing for the same commercial dollars. The other one is 
is more under our control. And I call it displacement of sales. And when you do go to a credit union or a small community bank or a farmer's market or a renewable energy, wind energy in your community or a community health clinic or any number of things that are going on in this country, you are displacing more and more sales of absentee giant corporations who will be less and less able to pull the plug on communities and unemploy the workers with devastating effects on families and ship it to communist or fascist regimes abroad who know how to keep workers in their place. Let me take this opportunity to go to Charles Murray on this. I mean, you've already come clean as a libertarian. I mean, do you find this anathema to you, what he's saying, or does it seem, as opposed to instituting greater civic values like you had said? He's talking about commercial values and the commercial corporate process. Well, I'm, I'm listening to Ralph, and because I'm at AEI, where we have lots of CEOs and people on the board, I, I, I know a lot of these guys, and, and I, I talk to them in settings where I think that they're being very honest. <laughs> and the way they see what they are doing and the way they see the world and your view are so completely divergent that you're describing a world which they genuinely would say in their deepest heart of hearts, what is this guy smoking? Uh, in, in the sense of, of, of they see themselves not as controlling all these hidden levers and so forth. They see themselves as besieged. Uh, they see themselves struggling to, uh, struggling to deal with a government which is making it harder and harder for them to deliver goods and services to people that people want. So, so I, with, you know, there are some kinds of, of uh, agreeings to disagree uh, of different magnitudes, and I think Ralph and I should just say we're both from different planets. And, and you want me to uh, dis want me to disprove it? Watch how where you agree. You think we should get rid of corporate welfare? Absolutely. Crony capitalism? Absolutely. No more bailouts? Absolutely. Should we get rid of elements in the Patriot Act? The, the yeah. comprise yeah. of civil liberty? Yeah. Uh, should we stop uh, wars of aggression overseas and become an empire? Yep. Okay. Should we knock out some of the bloated military budget that consumes half of the U.S. government's yep. operating You're experience? from the same planet, obviously. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, now can I? No, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Now, now watch the con continuation here. Do you object, apart from how to do anything about it, Charles, do you object to the commercialization of childhood, undermining and bypassing parental authority yep, with, with violent that. programming? And right? Yep, I agree with that. Okay, too. that's a big one right there. Mm -hmm. uh, would you would but, you but, would you object to the lead industry that tried to block Pittsburgh professor Herbert Needleman from continuing and publicizing his research on the connection of lead contamination of infants, especially in poor tenements, I have which led to brain damage? On that. I, lead I, brain damage. I, no, no, I have no idea what that particular case is. Or how about this one? <laughs> Do you object to tobacco companies marketing to small children, trying to hook them at an early age, as they did for many years? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Lifetime of smoking, right? Uh -huh. And everything you have said right. so far is consistent with a libertarian position. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is we may disagree on the remedies, but we're not in different worlds. Your CEO, I have never met a CEO ever said, I have a lot of power. Oh, these poor people. They have so little power that they're shaping an $800 million no. military budget. They're so po no. powerless that they've reshaped the food habits of millions of kids who are now obese, high sugar, fat. You know, Ralph teach them how to nag their okay, parents. Me, Ralph and Charles, we've got let's, a couple of other planetary uh, emissaries let's, here. Let's, and let's, one, one real quick thing. This will not take long. Here is the difference. Yeah. Here is the difference. <laughs> uh, Sony Corporation or Apple <coughs> or ExxonMobil, for that matter, if I choose not to buy ExxonMobil gas or if I choose not to buy a Sony TV, they cannot come to my door, take me away in handcuffs, and lock me up. If I refuse to do something that the federal government says I have to do, something which is no more criminal than <coughs> refusing to buy a Sony TV, the government, in its infinite wisdom, can come to my door, take me away in handcuffs, and lock me up. Um, that is the difference between government power and corporate power, and that difference is a difference of power in kind, which makes everything else pale in comparison to me. Except the, the corporations Michael, have become Michael, the government. Let me hear from Michael, Michael, Michael. Ferguson and Excuse me, gentlemen. Slap him on this I'm going to, if, if I may, 
I'm going to uh, exert executive privilege here. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> this is Tom. I, I think that there, there, you know, there are a number of interesting, uh, you know, for any number of interesting forms of class conflict that we might discuss. One of them is the corporations against everybody else, and I think we've allotted sufficient time to that. So if you will, I'm gonna ask that we kind of leave that one because we you know, really opened a lot of interesting doors this morning about other forms of, uh, uh, of class struggle that might be uh, evident, and if we could kind of go down those roads, I think we'd appreciate it. Well, yeah, Thank thanks, you. Tom, and uh, let, let me bring Marx back into this since uh, a lot of you have done your homework here and read Marx. In, because it's talking about, it seems to me, we've got a bifurcated argument here, and I'd like to hear Neil Ferguson and Louis Lapman. So on the one hand, the problem is the corporation, so go after the poor corporations, go after those who could, I mentioned Marx, who control production and distribution, who are out for a profit motive, or take a more civic approach and try to align somehow, I think that's what I've certainly heard you, Charles, saying all, all morning, uh, as well as this afternoon, and take both one, one, one talks about a seemliness and all of that, changing the culture, really. Neil, where do you come down? Well, as I listen to Ralph Nader, I ask myself, Ralph, do you own a cell phone, a car, a laptop? Does your house have air conditioning? Keep going. <laughs> I'll have to keep going. Because <laughs> I'm waiting for answers. Do you own any of those things? That's not my definition of quality of life. Well, I, I don't have do enough you time. Own, do you no, own no, 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 no. I don't have a, enough time in the day for that. Do you stuff. own a personal computer? Absolutely not. I use an Underwood typewriter, and when the lights go out, I'm still working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not finished. Did you, did you walk here? Yes, I walked from the lunch. <laughs> to get to San Francisco? What mode of transport do you favor? Some, some good transportation, like you have a airlines. Car. You have a car? Or you fly by, you do take commercial airlines. Well, it's hard to get across in horse and buggies. Yeah, well, <laughs> but you see, horse and buggy is really what you're recommending. I mean, in the morning panel, it was interesting to hear mm -hmm. golden ages evoked. I think Robert Reich wanted to take us back to the 1970s, and Charles thinks everything went wrong in 1964, which was when I was born, which makes me feel slightly nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but in this panel, in this panel, two panelists, first Lewis Latham and now Rob Nader, want to take us back to before the Industrial Revolution. No, I now, don't. No. No, well, you, you invoke, Lewis, you invoke the memory of Tom Paine. I did. And the values of the golden age of around 1776. And I think I heard you say that things went wrong in the 19th century with the advent of corporate America. We then had to listen to Ralph uh, Nader rant about the evils of corporations, as if co corporations had done nothing but seek to exploit the people of the United States of America. It's bizarre. You haven't Corpor heard. It's bizarre. Corporations yeah. have produced. Yeah. Wait a second. I mean, what have corporations produced? They have produced nearly all the technological innovation that there has been since the Industrial Revolution began. In the period since the Industrial Revolution, a massive improvement in the quality of human life has occurred, driven by corporations, joint stock companies that were able to innovate first the production of textiles, then the production of iron and steel, and so on. Through the revolution in electrical engineering, through the revolution in chemicals, it has been corporations that have driven innovation. Not only has this massively increased the income of the average human being, including even in the non-Western world, it has more than doubled life expectancy. And you expect me to sit here as an historian and listen to these fairy tales about the evils of corporations? I frankly don't think it's worth discussing. Tom, and I'm just, glad you let me enlighten But you. it is nonsense, and Siebel <laughs> scholars should know that it's nonsense. Let, 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 let me enlighten you. Hold on. Let me enlighten you. Wait, 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 Ralph, hold on. Let me, let me follow up with Neil. Oh, no, I can't. With somebody, uh, hold, hold, no, just right. hold your fire for a moment. We'll get, I just yeah. want to know where you would go, though. I mean, aside from all the contention here, let's get back to this whole panel was supposed to be about looking toward the future, looking toward solutions. You've made it more global in your presentation, but where would you go to make this inequality diminished or to do it even on a global level, let alone an American level? So who owns the corporations? Let's just think about that for a moment. Because it's not the chief executives that own the corporations. One of the key problems of Marx's analysis was his prediction that the means of production, capital, would come to be concentrated in a very few hands, in the hands of a tiny elite. But that's not what's happened. In fact, the ownership of corporations has been like the ownership of the housing stock, steadily more and more 
widely dispersed. And that largely as a result of the development of the financial sector, which has allowed people to have pensions and all other and forms of insurance. The, fun, the funds that cover pensions and health insurance are in large measure invested either in the bond market or in the stock market, in other words, in corporate America. We own corporate America. We as shareholders in the various companies, indirectly or indirectly, we own the corporations, which is why this analysis is absurdly out of date, like something from Berkeley 1968. Let's understand economic history. Let's not be naive about it. It's not corporations that cause inequality. And where do you, that's a naive reading. Where do you want to, where do you want to go then? Let me, let me pin you down here. Where do you want to go? Where would you like to see us go? Because we seem to all be in agreement about inequality. So let's first of all dismiss the notion that it's somehow the result of a deliberate corporate plot. Corporations do not necessarily want consumers to be poor. That's not particularly to their advantage. The issue of inequality is not about this. We began to get somewhere this right. morning in talking but, about education. Yeah, I'm, because I'm, it's well, very clear that education is the main thing that has begun to fail in America, particularly in my view at the secondary level. I think in some ways, uh, Condoleezza Rice last night got it right. Our single biggest problem, if we're talking about inequality in the United States, is the degeneration of secondary school education in poorer parts of the country. Let's talk about how to fix that, please and not rant about corporations as if this was 1960. Would you, Lewis Levin, like to join in here in this rant, or would you uh, want to <laughs> so-called rant? I, I wasn't talking about corporations. I was talking about rich and poor. I was talking about the idea of democracy as opposed to the idea of oligarchy. I was talking about the idea of democratic, democratic society as opposed to capitalist economy. They're different things. They're not and different. They're completely compatible. The, uh, the great success of the United okay, States okay, has okay. been the compatibility of Fine. capitalism and democracy, Lewis. They're not Fine. antagonistic. Fine. Fine. They, they can be compatible. They're not necessarily compatible. You, you, I mean, but actually, in most countries in the world today, they get along pretty well. And the number of societies that are both capitalist and democratic has been steadily rising through time. So I'm afraid your hypothesis is historically just not verifiable. It's not true. Well, if Lewis sees the well, rich in a war against the poor, I would ask you, Lewis, how to, well, how to mediate that war, how to bring it to some kind of secession, uh, moving forward again and looking for solutions. Well, again, I, 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 I think the solution is an education. I mean, I. So you're, you and, and Neil are on the same page. Yeah, I'm on the same page with him on that one. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily the same planet, but the same page. <laughs> So we should talk about that because but I mean, look, that's it's the a, issue. The difference is, and, and you you touch on this in your own book on in, in the ascent of money. When, when when money gets out of hand, I mean, you're talking about the finance that our modern forms of capitalism as great dinosaurs that are dying. Isn't that your conclusion at the end? When you assign uh, wisdom, virtue, and thought to to the a market. It's a mistake. A market can't think. A market's like a ball bearing. And a market, it, it, you, you can't get a human form of politics. Uh, the market won't give you that. Uh, capitalism might give you a uh, material goods. It might improve your standard of living. Fine. But it, to, to give a freedom of mind, which is what the democratic idea is, we're not all supposed to be like each other. I mean, it's, it's about individual uh, expression and freedom and exploration. And yet, at the heart of this argument, to some extent, in terms of where to go forward, is the idea, on the one hand, that there needs to be more regulation, which obviously Ralph feels for corporate. Well, well, you want to and the other side of that argument is there's been too much uh, regulation. There needs to be privatization, there needs to be deregulation. I mean, that's really what we're no, talking about. No, there's a about. difference between a valued, a, value, a valuable citizen and a valued customer. They're different. I mean, it, it, it's a different kind of conversation. But one can be both a citizen and a customer, and that is what most of us are very content But our politics don't address, uh, our politicians don't talk to the, the voters as if they're citizens. They talk to them as customers. They define uh, the, um, you know, democracy is the American Express card. That's the way the, 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 the way the politicians, and I'm speaking of both Romney and, and, uh, and Obama, I mean, they, they talk 
to the electorate uh, as if condescending. I don't agree with that. I mean, it seems to me what's interesting about the debates that we've heard right the way through this election process is that they've really been quite a sophisticated uh, discussion about two alternative Americas, one in which the state plays uh, a smaller role, uh, and this, I guess, would be closer to, to Charles's America, smaller in terms of the amounts of money that it raises and spends, smaller also in the extent to which it regulates and controls everything from uh, health insurance right the way through, through to financial institutions, and an alternative vision, which is essentially the president's, that the state will probably grow over time, uh, uh, not only fiscally, but in terms of its regulatory power. It seems to me American democracy is delivering uh, more successfully than many other democracies right now a very clear choice about the path that we should take. Uh, perhaps no one would disagree more than Mr. Nader because he ran for president on the notion that there's a duopoly that yeah. dominates us both corporate America, and whether it's Democrat or Republican. I voted for him for a pretty good reason. Let me have a few minutes here. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, Neil, I'd love to go at you two hours in, in front of I, I couldn't. I really would. Uh, for example, his first argument is the usual one, atavism. Oh, you want to go back to the 15th century. Every time we go after corporate abuse, it's to either go after them because of technological stagnation, like the steel industry, like the auto industry, or we go after them because they're fighting new innovations that might replace them, uh, like all the safety devices, all the detection systems in the mines in America, which would see, you know, detect uh, health hazards. The fossil fuel industry is a threat to the planet of the world. The genetic engineering industry and the nanotechnology industry, which have very purported asserted benefits, they're under no restraint and countervailing power. We don't have regulation of them. There are people here in this audience who could tell you that there are very serious risks to nanotechnology, very serious risks to rampant changing the nature of nature and the advance of genetic engineering way ahead of the science that has to be its governing discipline in terms of how it interacts with the ecology, but much less itself. Just a minute, you had, you had your chance. Now, he said, he said look at all the owners, all the owners. We have a brilliant system of property in this country. We own the most valuable property in this country. We own the public lands, a third of America. We own the public airways. We own trillions of dollars of research and development that built all these industries like biotech and aerospace and containerization and semiconductor. The taxpayer had a huge role here, but what he doesn't point out is the difference between ownership and control. We own the commons, but the corporations control the commons. Look at what they do. They get silver and gold uh, free for five bucks an acre on federal land. They control the airwaves 24 hours a day, which we own. We're the landlords. They're the tenants. They pay us no rent, and they decide who says what 24 hours a day. What business would operate like that? So he doesn't, he doesn't go to the split between ownership and control. Shareholders own the corporations. Anybody believe they control them? I mean, this is absurd. Well, let me uh, and, and respond, and, and then I want to hear from – I want to also hear, of course, from Charles. And, yeah, but I just want to get one more point. The issue is inequality – of power, which goes to what Tom, Thomas just pointed out. We should get back to the inequality of power, which corrodes a democratic society to its core. You would disagree with that statement, Neil Ferguson? <laughs> About the inequality of power? Power corrupts absolutely. To, 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 to go back to something absolute that power, I said you. earlier, the point about uh, a capitalist system with a democratic policy and the rule of law is that there are checks and constraints on the things that you describe. Nobody for a minute, least of all uh, I, would deny that there were major abuses in the financial sector in the period running up to the financial crisis. I'm not here to tell you that everything in the garden is rosy. But what we can't do is buy the notion that there is something fundamentally wrong with the system and that we would be better off getting rid of Whole Foods and having farmers markets, getting rid of the extraordinary achievements of, let's just say, the corporations that built the IT sector and replacing them with whatever it is Ralph has in mind that would be preferable to Apple, would be preferable to Microsoft, would be preferable to Google, would be prefer preferable to the companies that you guys are working for or are going to work for. 
I think it's absurd to sit in a room full of people like the Siegel scholars and insult their intelligence by telling them that the major problem in America is corporate power. What's your alternative? Farmers markets? Well, maybe, Louis Levin, yeah. we need more regulation or not? <laughs> But this is, a, I mean, that is a question for the legislature, for the democratic process. We do have 2,500 pages of new financial regulation come, that have come out of Congress in the form of the Dodd-Frank bill. I mean, whether it works or not is another question. But nobody can deny that there has been an attempt by the democratic process to deal with the problem of financial mismanagement. Lewis, what do you I, think about, I, I, uh, well, more regulation with Wall Street particularly. I mean, everybody's been decrying what's gone on as a result of the mortgage crisis and so forth. Uh, or is it abuse of power, or were there too many people eager to own homes? Uh, we get into that question, but what about moving forward again? More regulation, period. No or yes? Not necessarily. No, I mean, I, I, I would like to simplify both the tax code and, and, and the regulation. I mean, it, there, there's a difference between stupid regulation and intelligent regulation. What I want to see is more of an argument between the governed and the governed. I, the, I want to see more of the democratic debate rather than the, the sort of acknowledgement that money rules the world. I don't believe money rules the world. Um, the, neither does the democratic idea. It, 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 to me, it's about an idea. I mean, I mean, Charles is talking about something called you know, approaching a spiritual uh, reawakening. And, and I, I, uh, I'm looking for the same sort of thing. But you're all looking, I'm looking it seems for, to I'm me, looking for, for, aren't you looking for better citizenship, more commitment to citizenship, yeah, I, more yeah, commitment I'm, to democracy? Yeah, and I'm looking for education that's based on, on trying to uh, teach the student the value of his or her own mind. That's, that's to me, the object of, of the Of education. critical, independent thinking? Yeah, and, and so it's not a matter of memorizing dates or, you know, hit, you know, doing well on the SAT tests or so forth. It, it's, it, it's to awaken the spark of the, the spirit. That's what I'd like to see us be able to do. I, and Charles uh, would be in agreement, but let's talk about specifics. How do we make an education system better? Where do we begin to look for reform in the education system since we all seem to be on the same page there? Charles? K-12, um, E.D. Hirsch wrote a book called Cultural Literacy back in the late 1980s, which <coughs> if you haven't read it, is still well worth reading. And he's followed it up since then. And his argument was that to be a citizen of the United States, uh, there has to be a core body of knowledge that everybody grasps. You know, Everybody, if you don't know what Bunker Hill means, you can't participate in certain, certain kinds of conversation about this country. And the same goes for a variety, a variety of topics which he explicitly identifies. And there's also a core of uh, world knowledge. You know, if, uh, if you do not know of what uh, the phrase Achilles' heel refers to, there's a lot of literature where you're reading along and you're going to stumble because you don't know what that means. And so the first thing I'd do uh, if I were czar of uh, the K-12 education system is, I'd install E.D. Hirsch's core curriculum in every public school in the country. Very unlibertarian, but uh, it would, I think it's, 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 it's the kind of thing. This country doesn't have a glue of nationality or, a, excuse me, a glue of ethnicity. doesn't have any kind of, of religion, religious glue. The glue consists of a common understanding of what it means to be an American. So that's step number one. Step number two I alluded to this morning. Um, we get rid of this hierarchy of dignity associated with different occupations. The way that I like to think of it is this. Uh, I, by the way, I know this sounds very idealistic, but why not? Look, all of us, whatever our career may be, follow the same path. If you are a professor of history, Neil, uh, you start out as an apprentice, and after you get better, you sort of understand your profession, you, you become a journeyman, and when you get really good at it, you, Neil, are a master craftsman. Well, that's what an electrician does. You know what? That's what a good busboy does. And if you don't think that there is such a thing as being a master busboy, 
you've never been a busboy. Uh, there, 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 there are skills associated with it. We, what we need to do is reconstruct the way we look at success in education and using as the common bond that ties us together is that whether we're physicists or uh, busboys, that, that we go through that same career framework and that the dignity associated with that ought to be similar. I don't think that's out of the question. In terms of American, America historically, one of the things that was very widely shared was respecting people who did things well, no matter what it was. So we can, we can, we can use the educational system to restore that. We do everything we can to undercut the artificial, inflated prestige associated with academic credentials in, uh, in, in the, the kinds of things that are taught in college. You see, I, 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 well, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I agree with that approach to education. And the first thing you have to do is, is teach people how to read. And, and we, we don't teach people how to read very well. I don't know if you've read the uh, public school textbooks, but the, the writing is so bad that why in God's name would, would any kid want to learn to read if that's what it came out to? <laughs> yeah. and we can we can do a lot better with that. Also, I mean, you also have to. <laughs> people can do well without schools too. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, Lincoln, so Edison. I mean, we we produced a lot of people that, that uh, didn't get. So it's it's interesting. That's another thing that's interesting about our schools that the tests show that our kids in grades one to four. Uh, at that point, when they're first coming into the game, are scoring at the, at the same level as most of the other children in the world that they get matched against. But then after, by the time they get to 10th grade, it, they've, they've, they've gone down. And that's because we don't teach them to read. And well, before you can start telling them what Bunker Hill means, they, <laughs> they have to know how to read. Ralph Nader, what would you add in well, terms of changing you know, <laughs> education systemically? Well, the, the title of this sy symposium is Class Warfare, which involves, implies a resistance mm -hmm. to uh, class domination by the few over the many. We don't have much. No, we don't. No, I, I, we don't. I, I but that doesn't that. mean there's not class conflict. And civic education, connecting classrooms to their local community, they learn about their local institutions. Uh, how does the water purified? What's going on in town hall? What about the local historical society? They learn about how the local economy works. They go back to classroom, and they, they learn the historical context of it. So they learn how to be citizens. In high school, they should learn how to use the Free Information Act. This is very critical in a democracy. They should learn how to build coalitions. They should know how to participate in politics. They should learn how to be skilled voters, skilled voters. They should learn how to uh, become skilled consumers. Uh, because that's the feedback that makes corporations behave better. A more informed consumer constituency uh, stimulates innovation, chases the rascals out of their market uh, share, and improves the quality of the economy. It's bottom up. Now, the class conflict comes in, for example, Walmart. Walmart has turned around Henry Ford's idea of paying workers more so they can afford to buy their car, the famous $5 a day in 1914 when he doubled the wages of auto workers. Walmart turns this around where it pushes a low wage society. By the way, the head of Walmart makes $11,000 an hour, eight hours a day. He's got over a million people in Walmart that make between seven and a quarter and 1050 an hour. But the strategy is when they tell their suppliers, if you cannot meet the China price to Walmart, then go to China close down and go to China. Now that's class conflict. That's stupid. That's in effect stripping their customers of the purchasing power that would allow for a growing economy. So the increased supremacy of corporations in the last two, three, four decades as the countervailing forces declined and deteriorated has in effect reflect, brought the worst out of corporations, not the best. You want to get the best out of corporations. You go after General Motors for not putting seatbelts and airbags in and better brakes 
And then when General Motors has to do that, they liberate their own engineers and scientists instead of letting stylistic pornography prevail over engineering integrity what and lives are saved. Let me, John, let me jump in here for a second because... Uh, How did we get on to General Motors? Yeah, no, I, wa I want to bring it back to education, particularly Neil Ferguson. I know you have a response to that. But I'd like to hear from you in terms of where to move ahead with educational reform. You know, we had a program called No Child Left Behind, and the title of that program sounded wonderful in many people's conception of what education ought to be, but certainly it didn't measure up to the hopes or the ideals that, was, that, that certain were attached to it. Where would you like to see us move in terms of educational reform, changing systemically? Well, uh, here I m might differ a little from my old friend uh, Charles Murray, who, <coughs> who stopped being a libertarian momentarily by rec recommending a centralized control of uh, if I were curriculum. Uh, I don't think that's <laughs> the way to go. Um, for a whole range of, of reasons, because that would be a power that could very easily be abused. In fact, the real problem in American secondary education is uh, very clear. It's a lack of competition. Uh, we, we ended the discussion of the first panel talking about problems at the tertiary level. The US has virtually no problems at this level. It's got the best ter tertiary education system in the world. It's the secondary education system that sucks. Look at the, uh, to use a technical term, if you look at the OECD PISA study, the most recent 2009 PISA numbers, so the gap in mathematical attainment, that's the real problem. It's, it's, they can read, but they can't count. If you look at the mathematical attainment of 15-year-olds in the US in international comparative perspective, the gap between the Shanghai district of China and the US, Shanghai district in top, is as big as the gap between the US and Albania and Tunisia. There is a massive problem of numeracy, and it is very clearly correlated to poor public education in poor parts of the country. The problem is the American model of, a, of public monopolies at the state level in secondary education is a failure. It worked quite well in the 19th century. It still worked quite well into the 1950s and 60s. It has now become a major problem because it's anachronistic. Like almost all monopoly systems, it suffers from rent-seeking behavior by the producers, in this case the teachers' union, and an absence of competition to raise standards. There is now ample evidence that the best way of raising standards in secondary education is to have real, meaningful competition. And that means more than just charter schools, which are often just within the system. It means having a real system of private education alongside the public schools. Now, my libertarian solution to the problem of American secondary education is competition. And I'll be very specific. What people like the Sepal Scholars should do when they're as rich or nearly as rich as Tom himself is they should found schools. We need to create a whole new generation of high schools, independent, free of state control, and able to teach to the highest possible standards, regardless of the means of families. That is the single most important change that you could make to the United States today. It is n the s change is not going to come from within the system. The system is too broken. The only thing that will really raise standards is meaningful competition. And don't be surprised if this works, because it's exactly how the tertiary system of higher education works. We pretty much have evidence, uh, writers like Jonathan Kozel, who have brought to our attention, and Diane Ravitch, just how ravaged the uh, secondary schools are in certain neighborhoods, and particularly urban uh, deprived neighborhoods, or what we often come under the rubric of underprivileged neighborhoods. There is that gap. There is that class division and chasm again. And right? Competition it, would solve that? Right. I, it absolutely would. We know it would solve it because we see it working in countries that have tried this. But the U.S. is very behind the curve because almost nobody who th thinks about this policy issue bothers to look abroad. The reason that the U.S. is falling behind is that it has failed to make the leap that has been made in many Scandinavian countries, that has been made in the Netherlands, that has been made in Asia towards a really mixed economy in secondary education. I don't know why we lag behind, because we already do this at the university level. The reason American universities are the best in the world is obvious. There has been a very, very healthy competition, personified, if you like, by the Stanford-Berkeley competition, between the private and the public institutions. It's driven up standards in an amazing way, and it's drawn resources into education at the, at the tertiary level. We need the same thing to be happening at the secondary level. Then unions are a problem. Uh, you probably saw Waiting for Superman. The Absolutely. Problem. They clearly are the problem. And the best way of getting around that problem is to create a meaningful independent, a meaningful private sector that they cannot get into. And, Lewis, you would say what to that, Lewis Levin? 
No, I mean, but how are we going to afford to pay for it? I mean, it, it should not be coming out of the public purse. That's why I'm telling the Seeple scholars, found <laughs> stolen. <laughs> well, you know, we have, well, can I just well, add one well, thing, well, Lewis? Well, wait a minute, I mean, I mean, philanthropy is going to do that? Well, absolutely. Why not? Oh, I see. Okay. Why not? Well, you, okay. Want to, you want to see civil society revive? You want to say that citizenship means something? Well, get back to the roots of civil society. In the 19th century, when, of course, there was a huge problem of inequality that everybody talks about, not just Karl Marx, conservatives were aware of it too, the response was precisely philanthropy. The response was precisely to found schools. Look at all the things that were found in the 19th and early 20th century. I may have found, found, I may have found a, actually a place for you two to get on board in the same thing. But Ralph's new book, he it, talks it, about bringing in billionaires. Is, yeah, this is very, very important. We have to pay more attention to the content of the education. Once the schools are modernized and, you know, the good physical equipment, because too much of the education, we've all been through this, you can teach uh, in the eight years of elementary school, you can teach it all in two years. I mean, it's, it's a process of studied procrastination until we grow up, keep us off the streets. The point is, it's too much memorization, regurgitation, vegetation. We, we're taught to believe, not to think. We're taught to obey, not to dissent. The mother of all assent in society starts with dissent, even libertarian dissent. Well, you know, I, 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 I should pay more attention to I content. Have, I have just had two children in the public schools of Brunswick, Maryland, uh, very recently. And I want to tell you, memorization is not the problem. Uh, and regurgitation. The idea that, that children should actually have to learn when the Civil War occurred is, you know, what you want to teach them to learn how to learn. And so they, and so, oh, it's just, I mean, the homework they would bring home the, uh, would take a couple of hours to complete it, and it was utterly meaningless nonsense. Boy, on that note, Charles, I'm sorry I have to come in here because we have come to the clock is telling me we have to stop. We will be back for more. I, I assume that uh, that last panel. Uh, it was pretty exciting <laughs> to hear, um, but I hope it was also illuminating. I mean, what we're trying to do here, of course, is illuminate class conflict and come to a deeper understanding of it, but also try to find a beacon in any way we can as to where to go and where to head next. Uh, and I thought what we do at this point, and let me frame it, we want to go to you, the audience, and we'll have roving microphones as we did before. Raise your hands. We certainly want to hear your reactions and all, but let's try to find some sense of questions and comments and concerns that you have that are relevant or germane to the essential thing that we've been dealing with here this morning, and that is class conflict, class war, and how it manifests itself in America, and particularly where to go, where particularly to heal or to abridge or in some ways to bring the kind of chasm and gap that exists to a diminished state. So we'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas on that and any questions you may have. And if you have specific questions for any of our panelists, particularly along those lines as I framed it, please feel free. Raise your hand, we'll find you. Hey, um, thanks a lot. I'm a 2013 scholar from MIT Sloan. My name is Elaine, I'm from Germany. Oh, and I'm Forgive me, thank you. By the way, when you raise your hand and you talk, identify what your scholar you are or where you're from, that's, uh, you did it without my even having to ask you. Thank you for that. Thanks. Um, and I'm very interested in uh, K-12 education. I have a question to Neil. Uh, what you suggested to find, um, to create a school network of private schools which actually create the competitiveness the school system needs. I'm working on a startup exactly doing that. Um, and what we struggle with is, you can certainly start a first school with philanthropy funds, but really to make it competitive, you need to have a model, not just operational, but also financing model. <coughs> um, to create that, and we're, sort of, we're all students, we're sort of struggling with how do you find that model and who do you need to bring in to help us with that. So a very broad question, but if you could give me your thoughts on that, that'd be great. Well, uh, first of all, I can <coughs> congratulate you on the scholarship and I congratulate you on, on the venture. Uh, this is really a, an exciting uh, field, it seems to me, with a huge opportunities in education. Uh, I hate to say it, in education as a business. Technology is creating possibilities for disseminating very high quality content at very low costs. That's already a major uh, a tailwind for your uh, venture. I've been reading a lot about this recently because there has been a great deal of experimentation in the developing world in, the, in this field. You may know James Tooley's work. Uh, 
Tully discovered that the schools that were really educating kids in the slums of Bombay were private. Uh, the public schools were empty, of both of teachers and of, of pupils. But small, privately uh, established schools were doing a far better job. Uh, and one of the things that he points out is that people pay small but real fees to these schools. That is their business model. They generally don't have endowments. So when I started to think about this seriously over the last few years, realizing that this is the bottleneck in the United States and that you're not going to solve it from within uh, public, the public school system, I began to think, well, what can we learn from the rest of the world? And I think what we can learn is this. The best way to raise standards throughout the system, including in public schools, is by creating a new and dynamic private sector. And the US conspicuously lacks this com uh, in comparison with international competitors. This is a, a, a doable thing if you take a twin track approach to funding. You definitely want people like Tom and his peers to be creating schools. And Siebel schools in poor zip codes would be a wonderful complement to this program of scholarships for people who don't need them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. I'm from, I'm from Glasgow. Uh, for people who do need them, really, really good schools uh, are a fantastic boon. Uh, and, but in addition to the endowment, you need a revenue stream. There needs to be some payment for this education. That may seem counterintuitive. Hey, they're the poor. They can't afford it. It turns out that, in fact, the poor can afford education and value it more if they pay for it. What you then need to create is a system of scholarships and bursaries whereby children who perform very quickly uh, can get the fees reduced or waived. There's never been enough of this. In its heyday, in the 18th century, Scotland had an amazing system of education, far superior to almost anywhere in Europe with almost complete literacy. And one of the ways that it really worked was that there were really a whole range of ways that poor people could get education without paying for it through academic performance. The final piece, and then I'll shut up, is it need, we need to benefit from network effects. It's no use if everybody does this in their own sweet way. This needs to be a nationwide initiative in which there's coordination and best practices established. Uh, and I think that's doable. I mean, this seems to me like a doable idea. And if more people like you are thinking this way, you will need to get together, make a plan, and roll it out. Good luck to you. Yeah, good luck. We're going to go to more of your questions. But first, I, I just want to bring something else in here, uh, sort of piggybacking or dovetailing off of what we just heard from Neil in response to the question that was directed at him. And uh, Charles Murray, I'm curious to know what you have to say about this. There's been one talk about uh, ameliorating the class conflict or the class war in America by income distribution. In fact, it's been a, a loaded phrase throughout this presidential campaign. But what about the idea of actually helping assist those in underprivileged areas through some kind of income contribution by the government? Uh, I reluctantly do not violently oppose the earned income tax credit. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that is the kind of thing that uh, I can swallow hard and accept. Uh, beyond that, um, well, I have written a book called In Our Hands, which uh, advocates taking the entire expenditures on income transfers, everything, everything from corporate welfare to Social Security to Medicare, the whole thing, uh, cashing it out and replacing it with a basic guaranteed income. And that actually has a history, uh, a pedigree with Milton Friedman that, uh, that, that is saying, look, uh, we will strike a grand compromise. Uh, you give us, uh, we will give you big government in terms of expenditures. You give us small government in terms of the government's ability to screw over people's lives. And uh, so that would be my ultimate solution. At some point, as costs continue to raise out of control on, on entitlements, it won't be next year or the next five years, but at some point when we're spending $150,000 per poor person, uh, somebody will say, this is stupid, and we will, I think, uh, that the door will open for that kind of solution. I asked you the question specifically because I, I'm familiar with what you say and in our hands, but you also talk about a new tax code and school choice as part of the solution or part of what's necessary to start moving towards some kind of solution in terms of this class gap. And, and despite my remark about what I would do if our educations are, uh, I, I am in favor of all the things that, that Neil did. Uh, but I do think that education is a public good. 
and right. as a public good, it is it is uh, entitled to government support. Uh, I simply want to put the money in the hands of parents, and I would make the argument that first we are spending plenty uh, per pupil throughout the country, <laughs> including in big city terrible urban school systems, uh, to pay for really good education. That I just simply have given up on government schools as a way to do it. I think it is a classic case of what Manker Olson uh, used to call institutional uh, sclerosis. All right, more solutions or more ideas or more questions from you in the audience? Just raise your hand, we'll go up there, yeah. And sir, and sir. Hi, uh, Josh Bennett, Kellogg, 2005. So this morning we talked about the ways in which um, technology and globalization have created a U-shaped job distribution. And I'm having a hard time imagining any set of solutions really reducing class conflict without either something like direct income support or some sort of change in that distribution. So I'm wondering if um, folks could comment on the prospects for change in the landscape of jobs that are available to people well, and Lewis, what might help that. Louis Lebman, Ralph Nader, please. Well, I mean, we had an idea this morning, of, uh, it was you, Charles, of, of, about uh, vocational training, right? Yeah. That would be one way to do that, wouldn't it? Yep. The, um, I, you, you might want to cut down on illegal immigration. That could open up a job. I mean, it, it, because we, uh, if we suddenly said to an employer, if you are employing an illegal alien, we will fine you $100,000, that would free up quite a few jobs, I think, wouldn't it? Huge jobs. Yeah. <laughs> that, and, and, and add on onto that a, 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 a raised minimal wage. Ralph Nader. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are 30 million workers in America today who make less than workers made in 1968 adjusted for inflation. Just think of that. The economy has doubled in productivity, worker productivity since then. It's doubled in terms of GDP since then. 30 million workers are making between $7 and a quarter federal minimum wage, a little higher here in California, and $10 and a half, which is the adjusted minimum wage from 1968. Now, one way to create more jobs is create more consumer demand. I mean, that's really radical. Consumer demand creates more jobs in the directions that the consumers want. That's number one. Number two is if you reorder public budgets away from corporate welfare, if you have, you don't allow 25 giant corporations to pay no federal income tax, like Verizon didn't, and General Electric, and so on. It's all documented by the Center for Tax Justice in Washington. And if you cut the bloated military budget, if you start cracking down and fining the corporate crime wave, which the Wall Street Journal, you know, writes about every day, nothing you've heard from me today has not been written in USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, 60 Minutes, you name it. We're not reacting to the exposés. But if you re take that money and put it into public works, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, there's four to five trillion dollars of deferred maintenance for schools, clinics, libraries, public transit, sewage and water system. Not just repair them in the old way, but repair them in ways that provide an outlet for much more in innovative applications. And, and instead, what are we doing? You know, we're, we're tax building football stadiums saying that that's going to create jobs instead of building recreational centers in the city, in the neighborhoods, for unorganized sports or amateur sports, we're building, like in Washington, D.C., uh, $650 million for the Washington baseball st stadium. And the football stadium, they're only open about eight or nine days a year. That's a real job producer. So public works that are universally supportive of a higher quality of life way overdue, great jobs, pretty well paid, they can't be exported because they deal with reality here. Neil, can you give a quick response because I want to go back to the audience. Don't be too pessimistic about what globalization and technology are going to do next for the United States. Number one, energy revolution is underway that is radically going to reduce the cost of manufacturing in the United States. Two, the China price in terms of labor costs is disappearing fast because of demographic forces uh, in China. If we could get our act together 
and reform the tax code and address the entitlements business and stop playing Russian roulette with debt ceilings and fiscal cliffs, we could double the growth rate in this country in the next, well, let's just say four years. Uh, more solutions from you, by the way. We'd particularly like to hear some of you who have some thoughts about where we might go to bridge this class divide we've been talking about. Yeah, class war. Uh, thank you. Uh, Larry Rizzo, Virginia. Yes, Competitive Enterprise Institute in Washington. I was a former speaker, and I'm pleased to be here today. I've profited from this uh, discussion and the one this morning, but I'm surprised that there's been so little talk of, of the political consequences of class conflict. Uh, because, in fact, as a political system, as a representative democracy in limited government where people have freedom, we have to be concerned about domination, as Ralph Nader has talked about, by uh, uh, the wealthy, the elite, and so on. And I would just like to throw out two propositions for your comment that may get you started on this. Uh, John Adams, uh, and by the way, the material circumstances of life are much more equal now than they were before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, when, when, when the Continental Congress was called in 1775, the planters of Virginia took car horse-drawn carriages driven by slaves. John Adams walked from Boston to Philadelphia, and he was part of the elite, right? John Adams observed that the problem of preserving a limited government and freedom was not that there was no way to get rid of elites, but that we had to prevent them from colluding with one another. And what we have now is the financial sector and the geographic integration through communication and Washington, as Ralph Nader, I think, partly correctly points out, they're all in collusion now. The government is in cahoots with corporations. Uh, the second thing is I would say a lot of our problems are uh, <coughs> what Jeremy Rapkin called faux egalitarianism, <coughs> which is wealthy people like Thomas Jefferson, the founder of the Democratic Party, whipping up poor people to, to be resentful of the benefits of uh, the people in the middle, the middle class. And a lot of our politics is essentially uh, that uh, activity of, of faux egalitarianism. Yeah, thanks for that historical perspective. That seems right in your uh, bailiwick, Lewis Lapham. Can you? Well, yeah, because our politicians don't address uh, Americans except with the, the modifying adjective. I mean, black American, female American, old American, young American, and so on. I mean, they address them in the way they don't, they're not addressing the noun. They're not addressing them. What is an American? I mean, uh, and how do we define that? What Charles calls American exceptionalism, what uh, Paine called the birthday of the new world, the, the emotion of being an American, the, the essential optimism and the hope for uh, a new beginning and a, and a better deal. And, uh, our, our politics is, works along the lines of, of advertising, I think, demographic. They break it up into red and, and blue and, 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 and so on. And that's missing the point. I mean, we're not, we should be asking ourselves the question, what is it that binds us together? Uh, not is it, I mean, it, not uh, what is it that uh, separates us. And, and, and Americans are about becoming. It, it's not about being. It, it's, uh, it's about the journey, uh, the making oneself up as one goes along and the it, it's not we don't define ourselves by our uh, our past we, we def what we have in common is our hope of the future and, and our politics are not speaking to us that way I mean uh, advertising political advertising is the, is the voice of money talking to money I mean, it's, it's, it's not talking to your, your, your fellow citizens. It's also mostly negativity, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we've yeah. had, you know, a war on poverty, a war on drugs. This is a class war we're talking about today. I'd love to, again, hear some thoughts about where to go to ameliorate it or to bring the war to some sense of uh, diminution. Yes, up here. Right, uh, thanks again for taking the time. I'm Ed Helen, a 2012 Siebel Scholar from MIT Sloan. Um, Kind of building off the American unity, it seems like a lot of the proposals have actually talked about um, whether it's vocational programs or kind of better education is really pulling the bottom up, but it doesn't really speak to this idea of how do we, you know, keep people from living in their own enclaves and, and bridging those gaps. So I, um, I guess would love to hear uh, 
one proposal or thoughts on how do we really bring people together uh, in terms of, you know, making it so that even, you know, the, the, the greatest educated um, don't end up just kind of living their lives alone, even if there is growth that brings everyone. How do we really bring That's back? A, I think a very vital question. Everybody's talking about uh, bridging the, the class divide and teaching more about civic and citizenship. And but I think your question, the import of your question, as I hear it, is how do we create greater unity, right, or greater common purpose? Yeah. Well, he was also asking us specifically about, I think, geographic separation. Is that correct? Well, I, I won't repeat what I said earlier except to summarize it, uh, namely that any attempt by the government to establish a program in this regard is running up against the underlying dynamic of how this segregation has occurred. It has occurred because of parents trying to choose the environment that they want most for their children and, uh, and one that they think will be the most fun to live in. And the, 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 I don't know of any way for the government to get in the way of that, which is not destructive. Uh, the change must occur person by person. And that was why I gave the little speech earlier. I want you to think about what your self-interest rightly understood is when you decide on where to live. But that is the only way it can happen. That's why I wrote the book. But on the other hand, America's culture has turned on a dime in a variety of cases very quickly. Uh, think of the Civil Rights Revolution, which really went from close to a zero start in about 1953-54 uh, to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in a decade. Uh, think about how long it took for smoking to become absolutely de classe among the new upper class and the upper middle class. That took maybe half a dozen years. You became a pariah if you, uh, if you smoked. Uh, the good news about the reaction to my book is that a lot of the audience, which consists of people like you, members of the new upper class, uh, in the Q&A are not saying, gee, I never thought of that before. They're saying, this, is all, this has already been bothering me. I think there is the potential out there for a cultural shift. But you've got to talk about it in terms of individuals acting in their own best interests and their, and their family's best interests. And change can occur. Ralph Nader. Well, let me just introduce a little framework here, uh, breaking down the class uh, warfare or class con uh, conflict. Uh, let's look at subclasses. Let's look at the, the class of the taxpayer, the class of the worker, the class of the consumer, the class of, uh, of the uh, community as a class. I mean, without community, there's crisis. Uh, and take our different roles, uh, worker, consumer, small taxpayer, patient, whatever, and, and voter. And then see in each one of these vertical slices uh, what kind of class conflict there is. I mean, in the voter area, there is voter discouragement and suppression uh, along an income line. We see a lot about that now. And it's complex. It's not just what the Republicans are trying to do with uh, voter ID. In the taxpayer area, clearly the, the more powerful taxpayers have been able to game the system quite beautifully, especially corporations. Uh, General Electric tax lawyers get bonuses when they go to zero and when they get money back called tax benefit from the Treasury. In the area of the worker, this is where unions come in. Investors collectively bargain through their corporation. But workers are individuated. In fact, uh, corporate strategy is very much toward individuation. They do not like community strength arrayed against them Let me or it bargaining again, power. Well, so me. I just think this is a, no, this because, is a good uh, way to look at this. You're, 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 I, I want to bring it back to the, the import of the question, which is how we provide unity. And I think Neil wanted to offer some suggestion here. I mean, bring the country together in terms of common purpose. The issue of residential segregation prompts me to warn you against imaginary golden ages. Uh, I already alluded to this once. I have to tell you, this is how the world works. Through most of history, there has been a tendency for people to shift their location to the nicer neighborhood and to leave the, pu the poor behind in the less nice neighborhood. And I imagine that you could stop this and turn the clock back to 1950s Iowa in an age of very rapid urbanization, I think is, is illusory. Uh, so let's be clear about what we can and cannot do. We can't kind of bus people from the Upper East Side <coughs> to the Bronx uh, for their own moral good. Uh, <laughs> so let's just, let's be realistic about what this country's history has mostly been like. 
And let's not keep choosing golden ages to begin the discussion. Do you think there wasn't residential segregation in urban America 100 years ago? You bet there was. Imagine taking a trip to New York in 1912, what you would have encountered in Hell's Kitchen and what, what you'd have seen just a short distance away on, on the Upper East Side. So I think we have to be very careful about what we can aspire to. The key is not to change the, the configuration of our cities. The key is to make sure there's social mobility. And the big problem that we have is that people get stuck in the slums and have no prospect of getting out of the slums. That's the issue that we need to address. With growth and social mobility, the problem, itself, it seems to me, takes care of itself. With stagnation and no social mobility, then you have ghettos. You have something altogether worse uh, than they would have been in 1912. So that's really the issue. Adam Smith has a great line about this in The Wealth of Nations. He talks about the stationary state. He's actually talking about 18th century China. But what he says very interestingly is, in a stationary state where there's no growth, the elites do just fine. This goes to the point about the collusion of elites. It's the laboring majority who are poor, who suffer. It's growth, therefore, that is really the most important solution uh, to this problem. We, we've got to get out of the stationary state. Uh, let, me, let me go to Lewis Lapham on this. Uh, sometimes you hear the argument, and then I want to go more to the audience again. You hear the argument that, um, uh, yeah, the rich may be rich and the poor may be poor, but there are a lot of, um, and you hear this particularly, I suppose, from the right, there are a lot of those uh, who are, by many standards, indigent or impoverished, out of work, whatever, but they have television sets. Uh, they, even in many instances, certainly have computers, air conditioning, all of these kinds of things. And it seems to be the suggestion implicit in that that uh, everybody has an equal opportunity. What we're saying here, it seems to me underlying this, and it gets back to what Charles writes in his book between the work ethic and the jerk ethic, is that you know there are too many people who perhaps live off of entitlements and take it easy uh, in that way and don't really appropriate a work ethic, uh, become too dependent, in other words, and yet they have the independence of having, say, the accoutrements of modern or contemporary life. Can you say what to that, Louis? Well, well I mean, it, that's a kind of bread and circus thing. I mean, I, I can remember going to see uh, Larry Tisch. I think it was Larry. I can't remember. One of them was whoever was running CBS in, 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 Larry in the 80s. Larry and, and I wanted to do a show, a, a television show that was about history. And I thought Tish would go for that and uh, because he'd given you a lot of money to NYU. And he, he, we had this meeting, and it was top of Black Rock and a bare table, beautifully polished wood. And I went through the pitch for about three minutes, and Tish put up his hands and he said, he said, Lewis, you ever watch television? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> well, who the hell do you think watches television? I mean, it's, it's for the Schwarzen in, 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 in Arlen. They, they, they can't go anywhere. He said, you and I, we, we have places to go. I mean, they don't. So they got television. So it's entertainment. I mean, that's, that's what they want. It's a kind of bread and circus. It's a substitution. It's a sense of, of participating in, in, in the, uh, the virtual reality. And, the, and also, the Internet seems to work that way. You would think that, okay, with the Internet and Facebook and Twitter and all kinds of people talking to each other all the time, maybe that's a kind of community. I mean, that's... I've, said, I've listened to people saying that there is the democracy, and, and that's how it, uh, it's still with us. But on the other hand, you can also use the, the Internet to uh, retreat in, into a constituency of one. The majority of people use it for games or pornography. I mean, oh. actually. Okay. Well, I mean, this is okay. disturbing because you think about television and the Internet as being these great promises for uplifting democracy and providing education, yes. and in some ways they have, and in many other ways uh, there's been a yeah. darker side. But it's also a way of, of, of not having to go out and talk to other people face-to-face, -face, and it's also a way of being able to log in to whatever is a reflection of yourself. I mean, it, it's the same kind of thing that Charles is talking about. It's working against community instead of in favor of it. It's virtual. It's not real. Yeah. 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 Let me, uh, social mobility. Yeah. We'll go <coughs> ahead. 
Hi, uh, my name is Barack Bengal, Siebel Scholar 2004. Um, and I'm an economist by training and a type A personality by genetics, I guess. Um, and so that meant I, uh, it means I left this morning's session trying to think about all the different reasons that had been presented uh, regarding just the growing inequality and trying to bridge that and transition that into sort of what do we do about that. Um, and there were a couple of comments that had been made. Um, you know, if you, if you look at this morning's session, I talked about a variety of reasons and really comes down to whether or not this is an economic uh, disparity that was the cause or the driver versus the civic society social capital element of it. There were a couple of comments made this afternoon that said, well, or even this morning, I think, um, Charles, you were saying, well, it doesn't really matter what caused it sort of we're here. And I think, Neil, this afternoon you had said, well, you know, here's all these different reasons. They're probably all contributing, but there's an element that says we need to be able to rank them. And again, as an economist, I think we have very finite resources. It doesn't matter if they're government resources, it doesn't matter if it's billionaire resources, whatever it is that we need to attack or whatever it is that we need to uh, devote time, treasure, or talent to, we want to make sure that it's the right approach. And you can imagine that there are very radical different solutions. If there's economic problems, you could beef up their earned income tax credit, or you could do things around globalization technology and take some restrictive, I don't know, trade practices or something like that. Um, or if it's social capital, you could, I don't know, give people housing credits or invest in some of the, the private schools we're talking about or invest in getting internet millionaires towards getting a sense of civic community. There's a bunch of different solutions you could imagine, but they're quite diverse. The piece I'm not necessarily hearing, and I was hoping to get your thoughts on is, how does one begin the process of even ranking these two very different paths or directions um, towards coming up with an answer? Like there's a lot of energy here, and there's a lot of energy that's focused in this country about class warfare or conflict, how do you start directing that towards figuring out what the right approach or the right place to at least rank ourselves? How do we get the biggest bang for the buck? Well, I, th I think you're asking a, a particularly important question. It may boil down to, since we're talking about solutions here, it boils down to a question of triage. And I'd like to ask each of you, beginning with you, Ralph Nader, what your priority, your absolute top priority would be to work toward in the long term, as well as in the short term, a diminishing of class warfare. The top priorities deal with the problem of civic, lack of civic motivation. Once you get people civically motivated to get civically engaged <coughs> and advance civic uh, values, uh, you're, you're going to start getting action. There was a time when Sweden in the 19th century was very, very poor. And it, it rose, obviously, in about 80 years to the heights of uh, standards of living. And you, you ask yourself why, and what the Swedes have said is, it's the uh, growth of certain institutions, cooperatives, trade unions, best practices by corporations. Our society does not look out for the best practices that corporations have with the environment enough or with workers enough. Uh, we don't talk about how... Uh, 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 Ralph, can I pin you down specifically? The first, I mean, you've got, yeah. say, political power. What would be the first thing you would try to render in terms of either Congress or executive power? The main thing is organize Congress watchdog groups so we can recover our sovereignty over Congress, stop them from doing certain things, make them do other things. For better or for worse, until we re reconfigure our political economy, Congress is where the initiatory power is to go to, to, go to war or let the president go to war, to tax, to spend, to confirm nominees, to investigate. And it's the one most susceptible to change because you're dealing with turnover in elections and only 535 men and women, uh, senators and representatives. That, that, and you can do the same with the state legislature. But you can't do it when 99% of the people stay home. Uh, and, and when more and more younger people <coughs> are looking at screens, it requires personal interaction, uh, meetings, half a democracy showing up, half a democracy showing up, marches, city council meetings, the voting booth, the courtroom, you name it, neighborhoods figuring out how to deal with uh, decentralized economies, community self-reliance. It, it, to, to me, when you look at where people have progressed all over the world, it's where people had voice. They had voice as workers. They had voice as 
as uh, voters. That's called democracy. Let me give a voice to uh, another panelist here. Neil Ferguson, we're talking about priority here. Priority, you've got the power. Where would you move us specifically? It's, it's, triage, it's, triage, got, right it's got to be education, and it's got to be secondary education. Uh, I very deliberately at the beginning yeah. set out the options. The literature is pretty complex on this, and I wish I could say there's one fabulous study with an enormous multivariable regression in every conceivable country is covered with data back to 1900, but there isn't. Uh, and we actually don't have a, a very clear sense of what the right uh, thing to tweak is. I think it would be a mistake to tweak fiscal policy and expect that to solve the problem. Whether you turn the dial back to the 1970s, 80s, or 90s, I think that it's a mistake to imagine that everything hinges uh, on the tax system. That includes changing the tax cuts for the very affluent. Right. I think, I think it's a complete chimera to imagine that that's the solution when the real problems lie in terms of human capital uh, at, the end, at the lower end of the educational scale. That, that is where I would target all my resources. One little additional point. The debate about class in the United States, and I think this is what's made our challenge quite considerable today, is always conducted obliquely because everybody belongs to the middle class. So we end up with conversations about the 1%, the 99%, the 47%. The 47% number is particularly interesting. It became an enormous uh, problem for Romney when it was leaked that he talked about a kind of 47% of people who would never vote Republican because they were in some form or other of benefit, didn't pay uh, income tax. And he retracted that. But in some ways, I think he was wrong to retract it entirely because the, the fundamental analysis about the way this country is changing so that there are more and more people on one form or another of state benefit and fewer and fewer people paying direct income tax. That is a dangerous trend. I've seen the future because I grew up in a part of Western Europe where this happened at a much earlier stage. Today in my country, Scotland, 90% of households are on some kind of benefit or other. And if the United States doesn't address the ratchet effect, the tendency for dependency to breed dependency, it will end up in that place where the majority of households, and then nearly all households, become dependent on some kind of transfer from the state. You know I'm glad so Romney raised it, and I'm sorry he ran away from the issue. Excuse me, but you know why it's so but formidable to talk about class? Because, as the old cliche would have it, as opposed to the UK, where you come from, where you have a long established and perhaps in many ways ossified class system, it's been a dirty secret in America for a long time. Right. But uh, you watch Downton Abbey for a reason. Yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, and read Jane Austen. Uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me go to Lewis next. Uh, Lewis, okay, uh, we're, we're talking again about a kind of triage here. There's a class war. The divisions are rampant, maybe exacerbating, widening. What do we do right at the top? Well, see, I don't think you can do it right at the top. I, I think it's a cultural change more than a, than a political change. And I mean, it, it's, a, it's a change of w way of thinking or, or understanding what we mean by value. It, it's trying to understand the difference between the price of a thing and the worth of a thing. I mean, we've got a society now that, that is only interested in the price of the thing and not interested in the worth of the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's uh, a serious mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mistake we're make, making also toward the, uh, uh, the environment. What would you do, though, to hasten a kind of values reformation? That's really <laughs> what you're talking about. Well, I, I, again, I, I go back to, to education. I, I started out in life wanting to be a teacher. And I would, um, we're not teaching history anymore in many, many, many of our of Public school. Well, you said before we're not teaching kids how to read. We're not teaching. What are we teaching? Uh, well, I don't. Teaching history. Wait, wait, not teaching I don't know. We're, we're teaching them how to self-esteem. Pass, pass a self -esteem. test. Or, yeah, or, or self-esteem, or or social hygiene, or how to throw a football. I don't know what we're teaching them. <laughs> we, 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 the way the schools are set up now, they're trying to teach them too much. They're trying to, um, How do you teach uh, character? Well, Charles How do you Murray, teach people to love each other? How do you do that? I mean, the other thing that people forget is that the, the, 
when it came time to writing the Constitution in, in, in the United States, everybody is, has a, a Christian religious conscience. There may be Deist, and there may be Baptist, and there may be Presbyterian and High Anglican, but the, but the, the Sermon on the Mount is, is in the back of everybody's head. I mean, that is the glue that holds it together at the beginning. I mean, Tocqueville says that you, you can have despotism without faith, but you can't have freedom without faith. Well, and before, Charles, you kind of evaded the faith question. I don't want to necessarily put you on the spot with it now, but that's part of what you see as a cultural revolution. Can you go back in the secular age we live in and where religion has been... I mean, in fact, in the UK and in the United States and in the Scandinavian countries, there are far fewer people attending church, synagogue, mosque than ever before. I just have to start by saying that I'm amazed the degree to which I find myself on the same page with Louis Lappin about, uh, about the nature of the cultural changes that, that we need to have. And I think, I think faith is, is an extremely important part of that. And here I'm an optimist. I, I imprint saying that I think that the 20th century was in many ways the adolescence of the human species. Uh, we decided our parents were wrong about everything, and we're now beginning to realize they were smarter than we thought they are. And I think maybe faith and, and aspects of that, which will be very regenerative of the society, may be making a comeback uh, in this century, including among the new upper class. But here is the point at which I guess I should come clean. Uh, in the last chapter of Coming Apart, I have an optimistic scenario and a pessimistic scenario. I hope for the optimistic scenario, but I don't really believe it is very likely. I think that within a decade or so, the best bet is that we will be a social democracy very much like Europe, having to make a lot of the same kinds of <laughs> painful choices that Europe, Europe's social democracies will make. I think the American project, is, as I defined it, which is the notion that people can be left free to live their lives as they see fit, as long as they accord the same right to others, will be dead. Uh, I think that American uh, exceptionalism, uh, th in the way that Lewis uh, phrased it this morning, I thought was very lovely about the, the sense of we're Americans and, and the sense of Ameri being American together important above all else. I think that's in the way out. Um, so my best bet is there is no hope. <laughs> <laughs> that's very un-American. <laughs> You're right. That is very un-American. <laughs> raise your hand and we'll come to you up in the... Hello, uh, 2012 scholar from the University of Chicago. Uh, so one of the key takeaways I had from this morning was the change or the different mindsets when it comes specifically to education uh, between different classes in America. Uh, it's sort of uh, hit home for me. I, my mother-in-law is a teacher, and she frequently talks about the fact that uh, the students more and more, when they misbehave, the parents come to her and they complain that she disciplined her children. Um, and I was wondering if the panel had any ideas about uh, ways in which we might be able to, to work on that mindset and, uh, and, and repair that. And also if, without repairing that mindset, if other school reform could even be successful. Back to school reform again. Louis Lapham, you want to weigh in here? Well, I mean, school... It's the, again, it's the awakening of the, of the, of the child's mind. It's, it's, it's teaching the child to have value in his own, his or her own mind. All the teachers that I've met are, seem to me uh, idealistic people, and, and uh, many of them are capable of doing that. I mean, they, uh, we have a lot of talented teachers in this country. We really do. I mean, I, I don't know how to make them more effective or, or, or how to fix the, the system. I don't know how to fix the system. I want to be optimistic uh, for, uh, on, on this point. I think, I think that uh, empiricism is going to do a lot to, toward changing that mindset. Uh, the whole self-esteem movement has been pretty much blown up empirically, uh, and including by people who formerly were advocates of it, and they look at the data and they say this whole business of, of trying to foster self-esteem has backfired. There are other things, such as we have lots of really good evidence now that it's really bad to say to your children uh, all the time how smart they are and praise them for that. 
that it causes them to be very defensive because they don't want to endanger their image, not take risks and so forth, that it's okay to tell your children that they did well when they really did do something well, when they actually achieved something, but not to just praise them mindlessly for being smart. Other kinds of things, the helicopter parent behaviors uh, that we increasingly see. This is not working class. This is also upper class uh, where, where parents are, well, you know why they're called helicopter parents. They hover. Uh, there is increasing evidence of the ways in which this tends to raise hothouse flowers uh, who are not very resilient, uh, who, who don't survive well under stress. The reason that I'm optimistic about this is that if there's one thing we can rely on with the uh, upper middle class, it is that they are fanatic about adopting what is considered to be best practice for raising children. And I think best practice for raising children is increasingly sensible best practice. So that, for example, it was 30 or 40 years ago, to have agreement on scholars from the left and the right that consistent discipline is really important in raising a small child, that would have been unheard of. Now we have that kind of consensus. And as these kinds of things start, they'll start in the upper middle class, these can very well percolate down. Uh, this kind of thing could, in fact, improve parenting on a very wide scale, and it will do it because we know better after having done some really stupid things for several decades. Nice to hear a saying with note from you, Charles. Uh, Ralph Nader. Part of it is, is just learn by doing. I mean, John Dewey sort of coined that phrase, but the stu students, uh, unless they're really bombed out areas in the inner city, where, you know, the issues are greater. But they're bored, and uh, their discipline comes from they don't see what they're being told to learn to relate to their lives. So, you know, instead of uh, trying to teach them book language and book work, you know, you get, you get them to learn how to cook and bake you, you, in elementary school. You get them to learn what voting is all about. You get them to you show them that the courts and jury system is all about, and you have mock trials. And in the high school, you can use the chemistry lab, biology lab, and and physics lab for all kinds of uh, hands-on testing, testing heavy metals uh, in drinking water, testing soil samples, testing uh, vegetation, uh, science uh, applied to the community. And then the, the students feel that they're sources of knowledge, and they go home with the parents and, and, and tell them what they've actually done. We've seen this in action. We're just baking classes for fourth graders, for example or students that were very hard to learn, and a teacher entered them into theater work. And they just flowered in their acting, and they became less defensive and less introverted. So experiential learning, as it's called, has a very important place uh, in, in education. And, and let's not just throw that word education around. The greatest way to, to minimize class warfare and class con conflict is justice. It's called justice. The great work of human beings on earth, as Senator Daniel Webster once said many decades ago, when the abolition movement and the women's rights movement and the labor movement, as they increase justice for themselves, and it all starts with a few people. It all starts with a few people who are active citizens, and they represent the public sentiment, as Abraham Lincoln pointed out, and they increase their numbers, and things begin to happen. But justice is the great melter of a lot of conflict, not just between nations, but right down to the community. And we just don't talk enough about it. You, you hear politicians talk about freedom and liberty. I mentioned the other, yesterday Cicero's definition, freedom is participation is po in power. They almost never talk about justice. I read every, every speech Ronald Reagan made, and I couldn't find the word justice. But I found the word freedom and liberty. Let's pick you it up have there. them without yeah, justice. And you'll want to... Well, the, question, the question was specifically about what teachers uh, do when they encounter irresponsible parents who complain when their children have been disciplined. Uh, and this is a very important problem. Discipline is an indispensable precondition for learning. When I heard that we were going to talk about class warfare, for a moment I wondered whether we were going to be talking about the warfare that goes on in some classes in this country uh, and which teachers like your uh, mother-in-law may have experienced it firsthand. We need to think more about discipline, uh, and we need to, to figure out how we deal with the problem of irresponsible parents in a more effective way. There are two things there aren't enough of in this country. We don't have enough male teachers who served in the military. 
<laughs> you laugh. You laugh. Most of the people who taught me had served in the military, and we feared them. <laughs> we feared them. They didn't have to do anything for us to fear them. Just the sound of their approaching footsteps. <laughs> That's one. The other they thing. Also say that about parochial schools. Uh, many who have gone through the old traditional. There's programs. a lot to be said for for those uh, kinds of, of discipline and authority figures. And given that we are about to demobilize rather a large number of experienced service personnel, not all of whom will aspire to the heights of some of those here, MBAs and, uh, from elite schools, we should think about those, giving those men an opportunity to teach because they will bring discipline, believe you me. The other thing that Americans need to think more about is boarding school. I can always elicit a titter from Americans by saying the words boarding school. For some inexplicable reason, despite the enormous popularity of the Harry Potter books. <laughs> <laughs> Americans fail to see that boarding school really works. Uh, it particularly works for teenagers uh, because it, it can take them away uh, from the distractions and often uh, real, real distractions of their domestic life and put them in a completely contained, controlled environment where they have really no option but to study because that's exactly what you have to do at prep time and you all have to do it. So if I can add another reckless proposal to my now quite long list of tangible, actionable plans, you should include a few boarding schools in your business plan. But <laughs> now, I mean, all male and all, I mean, no, not mixed sex boarding well, schools. Actually, no, m most of the boarding schools in Britain now have become mixed, as they are at Harry Potter. The houses, of course, are sick. But, you know, I still can't help thinking about Swinburne, for those of you who, you know, those British boarding schools with the spare the rod type of stuff. I mean, it's a different sort of authoritarianism than your painting. But, I, I mean, I think you are out of date. That is not, that is not how the residential schools now work. I mean, why not? Why not? You send, for some ev even more bizarre reason, you send your children away when the summer holidays come to these things called camps, where they learn really nothing, as far as I can Lanyards. Um, <laughs> why don't, you know, that's not where to send your children away. Send them away when you're working flat out during the fall. Then they could really learn something and spend time with them in the summer when things are a bit more relaxed. It's easy. Be yeah, British. <laughs> You know the old, uh, excuse me, the old uh, formula uh, for success? Well, another thing excuse would me, be... Excuse me, let me get this in, Lewis. It's dress British, think Yiddish. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> another thing would be to get over the, the fear of money, where Americans are terrified. And we didn't used to be. The, uh, but I think that's very inhibiting to people. And I think that maybe that has to do with our poor performance of numeracy, but... But the fear of money that is throughout American society is, is very uh, debilitating. We have time for a couple more. So in, in the middle or in the back? Uh, oh, you've got one. Microphone. It's yours then. Huh? I'm Denis Kahramaner. I'm from Turkey. I'm Civil Scholars Class of 2013, and I'm a computer science student at Stanford. I had a question about immigration reform and whether it could be one of the solutions for class conflict. Uh, as you all know, there was a bill a month ago that would grant uh, green cards to science and engineering graduates uh, that have professional degrees. I was wondering whether you could address that and uh, whether w what would be a good way of doing immigration reform in a way that it could solve certain aspects of class conflict. You're asking the easy questions, huh? Uh, well, what about immigration reform? Who wants to jump right in here, Ralph? First of all, I don't think we should be a brain-draining society. We're hogging talent from third world that is desperately needed, engineering talent, scientific talent, medical skills, nursing skills, while we neglect tens of millions of people in terms of not giving them adequate training, education, opportunity. And, you know, when, when, you, when you start draining that kind of skill from continents like Africa, a lot of serious harm occurs. And we ought to be a little bit more, uh, shall we say, humanitarian oriented and say, let's develop our own here and not try to, in effect, cream off the crop, including entrepreneurial skilled people that are needed back there just to get the thing going. I mean, Africa is exporting nurses and, and, and we're importing doctors. We can't train enough here. So I'm against this kind of visa. It's amazing how many people 
uh, writing the New York Times like Tom Friedman and so on. We've got to keep these. Give them green cards. Give them visas. They've got to go to Rensselaer or MIT. Don't let them go back home. Well, it's back home where they're needed. And maybe if we supported democracies in a much more uh, thorough sense, they could get more done if we didn't prop up dictatorships as we have o over the years. So in that sense, I, I, I'm very much against that kind of uh, brain drain. I mean, it ought to be a subject. There's a lot of people get resentful. Younger people get resentful when they don't have the chance. But someone coming in and getting a degree gets their job. I disagree with that completely. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, apart from anything that's completely out of date, you know, the fact that you refer to the third world as a giveaway, uh, this phenomenon is much less true today uh, because of the dramatic growth rates that we now see uh, in sub-Saharan Africa as well as in many parts of the developing world. It's not a brain drain. Now, let me be clear. I have some skin in the game here. I am an immigrant. And I'm actually trying to get my green card. <laughs> so I have a certain interest in this debate. But leaving that aside, I see very clearly benefits for both the United States and the developing world from the free flow of talent across borders. And the United States shot itself in both feet with both barrels in the way that it changed its immigration rules. The Canadians have been behaving in an altogether smarter way, and they're not alone in this. Uh, all over the world, there is a competition for talent. And there's a competition to build the most effective hubs and the most effective network. That's the essence of globalization. Look at this room. Look at the people in this room. And you'll see the results of this fantastic experiment in the free mobility of talent. Come on, Rolf. This is 2012. Look at the people. Look at the physiognomies in this room. Yeah, tell if your policy had been adopted yeah. throughout the period from the 1920s when it was instituted yeah. until now, we would be looking at a completely different kind of group of people here. We have thank to goodness we didn't listen to people like countries you. Thank have goodness to develop we their own the barriers to immigration. Public works aren't being built in these countries. They don't have civil engineers. People are dying because they have <laughs> one doctor for every 200,000 people or 100,000 people. They're in New York. Half of the, doc uh, of the doctors in Manhattan are from abroad. Why can't we produce our own doctors and have these other doctors build their own country? People Charles, come here for training Charles, that they can't me, get in these countries. Let me, let me bring oh, Charles in. Um, yeah. In terms of my views of immigration policy, I think a country should control its own border. I have a lot of problems with the illegal immigration, uncontrolled illegal immigration. Otherwise, immigration has been the lifeblood of the American project. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To be uh, it, it provides the infusion of energy and idealism. I, I tell you, I uh, hang out with a lot of people who are new immigrants from a lot of different countries in a context I won't go into at this point, but I spend a lot of time with them. They are the most American Americans I know. And God bless, I want all of them I can get. I just have to chime in here, a little editorial comment. Recently I was asked to um, officiate over one of these, well, citizenship uh, <coughs> events where people who become American citizens from countries, as they say, from Albania to uh, Zambia, uh, have undergone what it takes to become American citizens. And it's one of the most moving and poignant events I've ever participated in because these people really want to be Americans and they feel an extraordinary patriotism about being Americans. Lewis, you were going to add something here about this, you know, this vexing question of immigration, how it fits into the whole picture. No, I, I was talking about the, uh, the illegal uh, immigrants. If, if, I mean, they're, they're being imported for our you know, use the cheap labor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if, if we find their employers, they would suddenly many jobs would be available to Americans at a at you'd also raise the minimum wage. So we're talking about wage. legal immigrants here. No, I, I was talking about. But you know, there's one illegal. more thing I'd like to add on this subject because Ralph wants to stop Africans coming to the United States. My wife just happens to have been born in Africa. In fact, she was born in Somalia. The only place in the world, it turns out, where she can enjoy the real freedom to speak and write 
as she wishes, is the United States. That includes, she would that not includes be, Holland, right? Including Holland. Yeah, because she, she lived was in She certainly wouldn't be safe in Somalia, Ralph. It turned out she wasn't even safe in the Netherlands, where the freedom to speak turns out to be restricted to <coughs> saying politically correct things only. She has come here, is going to become an American citizen, I hope, this year. And she, to me, is the single best argument in support of Charles's point. This is the key to America. This freedom to bring people to freedom is the key. Don't I, can't sit here and, I can't sit here and listen to no, you so argue they're, they're, that Africans should be kept in Africa for their own good. When don't I think put, of don't story, put words in my mouth. Well, put words in you your mouth. You sounded like immigration. No, listen, was listen what to me you carefully. Favor. You're difficult in detecting nuances. That's your problem. We're not saying there shouldn't be any immigration. So what, so what is there will immigration? always be immigration. But an aggressive program to draw people that are desperately needed in their country is hoggish. We have to have some self-restraint when we have tens of millions of people we're not training here so they can have their opportunities. Let me give you an example. Isn't it nice that Muhammad Yunus wasn't brought here on a visa to stay here? Instead, he, he built the whole microcredit movement, which is spreading in more countries, starting with Bangladesh, and, and, and had jobs for thousands, and, if not hundreds of thousands of women in villages. Isn't it nice that Hatan Fathi, who was called the people's architect in Egypt, wasn't here building skyscrapers. He was teaching Egyptian peasants how to build elegant little houses from the soil under their <coughs> feet. Don't, aren't we happy that Paulo Freire didn't come here and stayed in Brazil and developed these incredible literacy programs in terms of accelerated literacy for illiterate peasants? Yeah, it's we're not bad. talking about, where, you know, you try to win arguments by taking your opponent's extreme to absurd positions. That, to that, is, a, that is a dishonest treatment. And this is what creates class warfare. It's resentment. It's sense of injustice. It's denial of opportunity. We ought to get over it. There are people dying in the third world because the doctors aren't there. And if we didn't support the dictatorships, and as we did, and the Cold War and everything, as long as they were anti communists we supported Saddam Hussein. He was our great ally. But you know, Ralph, it's not so accidental no. that we come to this impasse toward right, right near the end of things. Yeah, but we've got to be clear here. Well, no, because I'll yeah. tell you why. But you're not I mean, when people, people cheer when they hear immigration, excuse me, a second exception, here. Exception. People cheer when they hear immigration helps build a country because it does. But then you'll also hear Americans cheering because I've heard this when they talk about immigrants who come here and live off the dole and do the sorts of things that uh, essentially take entitlements or game the system or whatever. I mean, like Americans in general, we're talking about a heterogeneous population. It's something that can be argued either way. And when we're talking about class warfare, we're often talking about just a subject of this sort seems to me. And the fact that we're at an impasse, I think, is all too well, ridiculous. But it is an impasse, really. To take Mohammed Yunus and try to win the argument with a couple of examples, oh, let's not stop there. It's too bad that the president's father wasn't kept in Kenya. It's too bad, right, that Steve Jobs' father wasn't kept in Syria. Think of all the people who have transformed not just America, but the global economy because they were able to come here. They were able to escape from the failed states where they were born. They were able to study <coughs> and they were able to bring their talent to somewhere where it could be used. I can't really yield in an argument like this because it is so clear that you are wrong. No. Let's just get it on the record. You did not leave Scotland for any reason that had to burlesquing the yeah. argument, Neil, and you know it. We're all inter Im immigrants. It's just the lack of self-restraint. The, the, the aggressive brain drain is outrageous when you have people here who are being neglected and not being given the opportunity. I wish there, so well, I wish there were extreme. an aggressive brain drain. I wish I could say the United States is systematically trying to attract the brightest people to this country and retain them. If only that were true, because it's not doing those things. But I have to be aggressive here. We've come to the uh, end of the time. <laughs>